Okay, that's very straight thing. So, transition systems. So, all these uh, nice things in CPS or time automata, all these great things that actually uh, just say, okay, I have a uh, memory state. Let's say, okay, it's described by the uh, tuple of uh, program variables D. And so you have some initial condition. And essentially, you have a state machine represented by the uh, relation, binary relation step that says, okay, so let's pick the values of the variables and compute the success of uh, values for the variables. Okay, so the very basic thing, no fancy things like procedures, threads, uh, high order, whatever, just yeah, the very basic stuff. So, while language, if you wish, or loop language. Um, so, you can capture those programs here. And so, there are two basic questions you uh, might want to ask in verification. One is assertion safety, and, let's say, and the other one is determination. Everything else you can do uh, expresses a combination of, of, of the two properties. So, and they say here, sort of, to, uh, to deal with the properties, so of course, we want the transition system to terminate. And uh, for, for proving safety, you say but the transition system is not supposed to leave the set of states described as safe. Okay? So, in the transition system, the semantic is start in the init and do steps until you're done. So, um, so this is the uh, approval for the for, for, for proving safety and termination, and essentially the idea is that so uh, how you can prove that something actually always stays in the safe place? You do induction by the number of steps it takes uh, the operation state. Yeah, and uh, so we say okay, so you do induction, so the only tricky part is can I switch it off for example? Is there a knob here? No, I believe. Ah, where's the speaker? Ah, echo is in this corner. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. This is unsafe. Okay. So, so you did that. And uh, and I'll type it in the. This guy. So the. So the induction is a little bit the tricky part of what we in school is that it's to find the induction hypothesis. And so what we throw in here, we say, okay, let's quantify the extension of the induction hypothesis. So in here, and say, okay, so the induction uh, sort of goes like, initially you want to uh, capture some of everything in step zero. So then if you get the induction hypothesis holding, and you make a step, so then the induction hypothesis gives you hold the game. And so the, for gravity, actually, I'm dropping all the universal quantifiers over so these and make primes. So all these guys saying this is the universally quantified. So now this is great. So we, we get the induction going and actually and to show that our induction hypothesis is strong enough, okay, it needs to imply the theorem you would be able to prove. So in for safety, we say that everything that's perceived to be reachable is actually safe. And for termination, what we want to do, we want to uh, show those predictions. Uh, so we want to take the, the program. Yeah, so the transition relation and restrict it to what we perceive to be reachable. Yeah, so for this intersection, you can see like everything is very algebraic and it's plain label with all these formulas. And so the way you want to do that is because there might be some loops in your program so that spin forever, but they're not actually reachable. So like by doing this intersection, you will cut the rope. Okay. 
is uh, in the inference process. Yeah? And in some sense, the, the, the problem statement is a solution in the logic, so, so it solves uh, that bit as well. Okay, so look, this is very basic and sort of many people are Okay, uh, so uh, let's, uh, okay, Andreas, uh, sorry, I'm going to skip this, but just to make sure that, uh, so that everybody is very this is an amazing method for proving termination. It's called transition invariance. And it's compositional, so it makes a significant difference. So, uh, so the idea is that uh, so instead of going for one of the relation or for many, so it fits in this world of constraints, let's move on. Yes. I think some people call it one look at a time. <laughs> okay, so, but this is another aspect, so, and that was actually one of the reasons why we started looking at this whole form clause business. Is you build your sort of uh, verifier sort of that finds invariance. And then you realize that actually, like, say, forward induction is not a good idea. Yeah, and so the one reason you might uh, consider that is that, say, your program is actually uh, written by a guy who is so, uh, like, cautious that every time sort of something unsafe might happen, actually there is a big check. Like sort of before you start writing to a file actually the only handle that you got from somewhere say, oh if the handle is not now. Yeah. So what it means is actually just by stepping backwards from the assertion for like very limited number of uh, times, you will build up enough uh, sort of information, enough context to uh, uh, actually verify the assertion. Yeah. And then you say, okay, well I wish I was going backwards. Uh, sort of, uh, from, from my assertions. And this, this whole world uh, was there, it was even papers that got titled like from prehistoric to post-mortem. So that these guys were thinking that actually going forward is much, much better because this way you stay in of supposed to reach you up to find and not in the chaos of the, of the erroneous work. But so that the is actually why to limit ourselves to sort of one way to another and hardwiring the two up front. Because essentially we don't know what's better. So sometimes one thing, sometimes the other. This is the way to do it. You say, so I'm going to do induction, but know the number of steps it takes to hit the assertion. Yeah? So okay, so the say same form constraints, you say I'm going to start from the not safe, from error states. This invariant captures everything that goes into the error states. So you you sort of execute the program backwards. So because you have a logical representation, you say, I'm going from the post state, the prime, to uh, to the pre state, and that's what goes into the invariant. And now sort of since we're going backwards. What we want to make sure is that everything that flows into the error state actually is not coming from the initial states. So great. And so the all of a sudden, sort of your previous engine that was dealing with this uh, sort of foreign implications um, can magically be uh, sort of retargeted for an actually completely different way of probing uh, programs by just uh, sort of taking a little bit the constraint generator. So this is pretty amazing. Um, and then what you can do is say, okay, sort of, uh, sort of party is on. So I can sort of burn, burn the candle on both ends. So you can go forward and backward, and maybe inside out, outside in. And you just, you know, sort of keep uh, sort of bumping up the uh, sort of features in your uh, VCJ. To say, I have a forward environment, I have a backward environment, and sort of this field is not supposed to intersect. And sort of let the magic of the constraints so I sort of do the trick. Okay, so we can do it. So that we see sort of already, so we see some advantages of um, sort of checkpointing the verification conditions, not covering them actually in the solving procedure. We can ch change the verification. And so that in the, uh, in some more slides, I would like to show you that actually we can capture verification conditions uh, going beyond transient systems and also going beyond uh, like assertions and termination. We can go, go things like CTL. And also we can do things like, so that's not verification at all, so we can do synthesis, temporal objectives. Okay, uh, so other questions so far? Who of you actually builds verification tools of some sort? Uh, why don't you work on verification? Okay, who of you builds model finding tools of some sort? Who of you builds model finding tools but doesn't call it model finding? But constraints only. <laughs> okay. Okay, let's let's get going. So okay, so this is my cover done with second. So okay, so uh, so now the uh, the amazing stuff, procedures. So our program is now sort of is composed from building blocks and everything is amazing. We have the push down stack and uh, sort of 
what we want to do, we actually want to reflect this, the structure of the program that is put in, uh, to, to, together to, to using procedures. We actually want to reflect this structure in our proof map. Yeah? So, so, and so the, how we do is, so first of all, so the, we pull in the information about what the program with procedures into our sort of representation. We say, so if we're inside the procedure, then everything is as before. We have the step relation and, and so on. So, and now we have two additional relations. One is called call and return, and so the as you guess. So call, what it does, it takes the, uh, the actuals and sort of puts them into the formals. I shouldn't have this. this um, and uh, in return, what it does is actually it, it takes the sort of, uh, return value from the quality scope and puts it into the quality scope. Or um, well, if you have a, like one dedicated problem there, it will be returned, so that's what the return is. Just take the, so what the return uh, statement does in the quality and so writes it in the quality. It's explicit. So, so we have all these guys. And uh, so the how, uh, how we deal with procedures is uh, it's actually it's, it's very beautiful and amazing. So there was a lot of literature on that. And every time you read one of those papers, it's like you stretch your head. And, yeah, so it takes a while. So now don't stretch your head anymore. So that it's all constraints. Yeah, and let's uh, look at so how this constraints capture the procedures. So the idea is that so what we really don't want to do is to deal with the push down stack explicitly. Yeah. So what we want to do is we want to capture the effect of a procedure call. Without actually sort of diving into the procedure execution. And um, uh, some people call it generational semantics, some people call it function types, and some people call it summaries. So some other people in the just call it summaries. Okay, so uh, let's dive in. So um, we start um, by, uh, by saying, okay, give me a summary. So it exists somewhere. And so what summaries are going to capture is the uh, is the binary relation. So it's not an binary relation, it's a binary relation. And it captures uh, pairs of states such that the first state in the pair is the sort of is the entry point in the procedure. Yeah? So the first is going to be the initial state of the program, beginning of main. And then further down the road is going to be the first state, like every time you jump into the procedure, it's going to be the first state. And the second state in the summary is going to be uh, any state on the same level of recursion. It's not allowed sort of, to say that the second state goes up or down. It's basically on the same level of recursion. And any state on the same level of recursion. Now, so what we're going to do is we're going to build up the summary relation. Essentially, what we're doing is induction in two dimensions. One level of induction is on the number of states on the same level of recursion. The other level of induction is the induction on the uh, depth of the, of the call state. That one will be the same level of Okay, so we start by saying um, okay, summary captures sort of uh, program starting in main and not doing anything. So it's an identity relation restricted to init. Yeah. So some uh, be not be not. And now we say, okay, so let's say so uh, we're not calling it yet, yeah, so we're doing the stack. Then what we do, we extend the summary from going to uh, somewhere to be one. Taking a step to be two, and now our no, summary goes from be to be two. Yeah. So, so, so very standard, very nice. And so that what comes uh, is the situation we're actually entering a uh, call set. Yeah. And the call set what we see is that uh, so this call relation that goes from the context of the uh, recording, V1, to the context uh, of uh, sorry, context of the caller V1 to the 40 V2. Yeah, and for me actually so the 40 is, is down below. So, so you, you have the caller v1, and so you have the caller v2. And so the caller is like is the uh, v2 is the is the first state of the uh, the execution of the caller. And that's now we saying, okay, so we need to bootstrap some for the caller. So now we have some v2 v2. And then sort of uh, business as usual, so we can do steps. And at some point, you get actually to the return state. Yeah, now we need to do something because uh, you know we are not really extending the return. And uh, since we hit the return, now we say, oh, this is actually great. We managed to get from the beginning to the end. So which means well, everybody who told us now can use this sort of uh, fast track information, the summary, actually to jump over the call. So and that's how that impacts the recursion of So uh, so there is some uh, caller who said, okay, so uh, so there's this guy I'm, 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 I'm jumping into the quality. The quality does fast forward from the to the three. And now actually I can use this fast forward. Extend myself from the one before the call to the, the four 
after the call. Uh, that, that, that's pretty much it. So you have this uh, these things going on, and uh, you essentially you capture program execution. So you're, you're not talking about the uh, stack, but you're talking about the what's it, sitting on top of the stack or anywhere on the stack. Right? And this is pretty amazing. Is that, you know, there is actually a, a little uh, but very important difference between the equations so of the simple transition systems and the equations of the procedural programs. So anyone can spot the difference. So who works on the on board at all? Who works on three at so, uh, okay, so, the, so the, uh, if you look at this stuff, actually, if you look at the body of the clothes, there's only one guy in, in, in blue. Yeah? So the guys in black, like, so this is stuff coming from the program, I don't care about it. So what the, the guys in, in, in blue, this is what we need to find. So for transition systems, you could say that our clothes are somewhat linear. Yeah? So there is uh, at most one blue guy in the body. Yeah? And so the, if you were to also apply resolutions of this code, it's actually what they're going to do, they're going to get a like, long chain. Yeah. So there's all the things, so it's a And uh, if you want to apply resolutions to these guys, because there are two blue guys in the body. Yeah, so if you get the resolution tree, you know, like this class, for example, on one side this, uh, this branch gives you power, but the, the, on the other side it actually makes things a little bit harder to solve. So, um, and so if you have two, it's, it's enough. <laughs> it's like in the, so if you have three uh, literals per close, you can call them all set, but you have three variables per inequality, you can call them the uh, linear program. So, same story here. You have three guys, you can call the arbitrary. Uh, uh, okay, so, and now, so we have the summary. Summary jumps from the beginning to arbitrary state, which you will. So now we can do, what we can do, we can do clear summaries and uh, check for safety. Yeah, so, we start somewhere in the beginning, very right? somewhere. At the end, uh, okay, it's rather the same. And uh, so, who worked on termination? Who worked on termination of programs with procedures? Yeah, so uh, these procedures, so they are quite the best in business, so they, they give a lot of headache. So, you yeah, you're raking functions of how it's supposed to deal with this call and calls and call, but what do you do sort of, if you're actually sitting here and sort of how do you suppose to arrange the job of this kind of uh, some of the uh, uh, Pretty nasty. So, more uh, no more. So, sort of, here's an A solution to, uh, that you can express using confluence. Uh, so, there are actually two ways for uh, sort of going on forever in a program with procedures. You're stuck on the same level of recursion. Yeah, so, you might go to the uh, you might call someone, but that all those guys, all those calls return. So you have to start, you keep coming at the same level of recursion. So what we can do, we can capture a sort of a sequence of states on the same level of recursion, but again, we call it round. And we uh, do this uh, by using the summary. We say, uh, okay, uh, so either you're just stuck in the loop, or you're stuck in the loop where you're calling someone. You're still sort of getting this round relation on the same level. Alternatively, what happens is that so you are, you keep uh, uh, pushing on the stack. So the beginning value you might return, but so the, the stack keeps growing. So we'd call it a descent relation. Yeah. And so the, the trick, the, the summary bit actually uh, captures all the calls and returns that actually that come back. Very different. So now what you need to do, so that depending on so how ambitious you are, you ask either for the boundaries of same level of recursion or the boundaries of the recursive descent. Everybody is happy, some of this various determination and conditions and the entire community keeps cracking. And now actually all this mess of dealing with calls and uh, this and that is actually taken away from you. So the only thing you are all need to deal with or understand at least at the end of the input point before it translates into its own world is uh, okay, so you need clauses that are binary or higher arity, and you need to support uh, the self of these constraints. Very different. And so the, another interesting part here, actually, that goes uh, quite silent, is by uh, using these uh, assertions, we are able to essentially construct relations that capture parts of the computation we care about, like descent. Instead of expressing our property as a assertion in the source code and then sort of painfully figuring out, actually, sort of what's the annotation language to say that you care about this kind of loops, but not the other kinds of loops, and so on and so forth. Just say, okay, this is Jen, so that uh, you can get 
Okay, questions so far? Those who build program verify is the determination with procedures. Are you going to implement this approach to the cloud in the coffee break? Yes or no? Don't be shy. <laughs> okay, so uh, uh, you can solve the, these things, and uh, so the, I'm going to hint the solution so that somewhere maybe a little bit further down the line. And essentially, uh, so your regression, so you need to uh, forget the models and pick up a different ways, and uh, if everything was finite, do sort of bottom up evaluation and uh, sort of data log style and get the list model and you for that that fellow becomes sort of unmanageable so you go symbolic and uh, sort of that fellow sort of doesn't terminate you go symbolic plus some sort of conversion of uh, acceleration using outside invitation, gravity abstraction, circulations, you name it. So essentially there is like uh, there's a ton of work on how to solve all these things and uh, so you're welcome to join the party. Um, okay, let's uh, move on and uh, look at the noise press and stuff. Uh, there are other communities, and so we want to have everybody. So we want to have everybody. Uh, it's, it's using our books, it's a bunch of books. So, uh, so, what if you. Uh, so, who does security? Yes, the security. So, they, uh, so very often in security, there's this notion of, uh, of secrecy. And so, when is something secret, if you can change it, actually, you want to that uh, sort of the change happened, yeah? Which intuitively means that actually you need to compare two computations, yeah? One was so, you know, driven by, by an input with a secret, okay, one way or another, and the other computation is written by a secret that was, say, random and yeah? But essentially, you want to uh, capture two computations. And uh, so, back in the day, uh, so you build this tool that essentially does program self-composition of any other sort of, sort of very tricky thing that where you can actually try to squeeze sort of, uh, these two computations into the uh, sort of input of a tool that actually takes one program to yeah? And uh, but now sort of with, uh, with this sort of declarative approach, you can say, okay, I have uh, all my uh, sort of constraints that sort of capture six summaries. Magic uh, triple dots. So, and if I care about, say, uh, proving non interference, what I can do, I can use now summaries and actually to, to, to virtually execute the program twice or as many times as you wish. Um, and sort of impose it. For example, you can say, say I'm executing the program and two inputs that are different. And so, so if the program is actually satisfied with non interference property, the output so should be the same. Okay, so the inputs are different B not and W not. So you do summary, so you jump to the output state, if you want. You jump to the output state W1. Now you say okay, so please prove that these two fellows are equal. Okay, so so you already spent like a bazillion years working on your phone for solver, so that now it's time to tell the security. Okay. So concurrency is important. Yeah. So in the again, so there's a there's a body of research on, on, uh, on concurrency and there are all these uh, amazing proof rules that sort of try to decompose the program sort of by the way the program is structured in threads. Hope you've heard this name. Actually, it's, it's pretty amazing. Once I was shocked, but, so uh, I was working with this, with this guy, uh, uh, the PSD group, so was my colleague with GMF. And then so we were discussing something that's like, oh, look at this guy. Uh, you want to just help me? Uh, the business advisor. Cliff Jones. Cliff Jones, the guy who actually worked a lot on composition of building for concurrency. And then actually, so I got some other colleague, Tony, uh, Tony Ford. And uh, so we were discussing, and Tony is very much into sort of object graphic approaches in this case. And he's like, oh, yes, so this, uh, so and Tony is like, look, ah, Tony is like his academic grandson. And so basically, fear no more, you don't need to reach all sort of. Uh, 30 years of papers about composition of reasoning, so now what's like? Yeah. So, and actually, it will give you two proof rules. And even better, so instead of thinking about two rules, actually, uh, so it will, it will give you a, a transformation from one to another. So, if you know what's resolution is, you're good to go. So, uh, 
first of all, so let's set up <coughs> the, the, the problem. So you have your uh, program state, but now so you have the shared variables, uh, change the globals, and you have L1 and two locals who say two threads. And of course, we can go for arbitrary many threads, but uh, we're not going to use that. So, uh, so they have initial states as before, they have the safe states, and then also they say they have two threads, and uh, so the step one, step two, uh, transition ah, relations. Step one and step two, transition relations. And uh, so that we write them over all variables, not only variables over threads, it's good just to simplify notation. But it's kind of implicit that the well, first thread cannot change the locus of the second thread, so the other way around. Okay, so the, this is this relying guarantee, this is sort of Cliff Jones and many other people coming in different names. And so the idea is, uh, is quite similar to, uh, to summaries. And uh, so what you do is so you try to actually, instead of present directly with the source code of, of the procedure of the coding of the other thread, you actually try to capture the effect of the other guy and reasoning the effect of the other guy while you're sort of making your own steps. So, uh, so the effect of the other guy we're going to call the environment. Yeah. And uh, so what happens is that if you have thread one, yeah, so if you, you don't care about the other guy first, so the only thing what you do is like you do your proof by induction, is that every time you make a step yeah, from uh, from uh, V to V prime, what you do you actually report some uh, potentially coarse approximation of the information sort of uh, the change in the step in, in your environment. And you say, okay, this is information I'm going to shift to the guy, V2. So essentially what you're saying is that you're contributing to people's environment. Yeah? So I'm sort of going from here to there, sort of doing a bunch of stuff and grabbing a lock. So let's say, okay, so okay, uh, I just grab the lock. Yeah, so this would be sort of what you would typically capture in the end. And so that on the other side, so sort of when you are sitting there not making your own steps, you actually you know that sort of the other guy is, is doing something. Yeah? And so but like the other guy is playing nice and is telling you in some uh, abstract for using the environment what they what, what uh, what's going on so so which means that actually if, so to try to prove by induction so you actually take it to the account what the other guy is doing and so you see your own environment is actually adequately capturing all those changes so this is this course essentially so if you have a threat you are sort of doing your own induction of those steps and telling the other guys roughly what you're doing and you're also importing the steps from the other guy and uh, now, sort of, you have two invariants that are somewhat uh, modular, somewhat local. So this is a subject of a huge debate. What is actually composition, uh, and so on and so forth. And you say the invariants, uh, uh, so the if you intersect them, so they actually get a stronger thing. So it's supposed to, uh, to prove your property. Yeah, this is relying guarantee, and you can do it to save your life and things like that. But now, uh, so the, there is the. Uh, there's this other approach which is called the leaky trees. Yeah. So you open up the books and start reading them. But sort of instead of opening up the books, let's do a little derivation step. So when we look at the derivation of the trees like this, so uh, essentially one way to look at them is that sort of the, what's in the value of the rules is kind of a lower bound for what's in the value of the rules. So the other way around. Actually, there's another one of these. And if you put this a nice fraction, Yeah, and so the, uh, after 
a sort of uh, in a long series of painful refactorings of the inference uh, engine code the same this 
the uh, resolving non-determinism comes in. You say there exists a way to resolve the non-determinism in my transition relation. But then I get back on track towards Q, which I'm back into the set of states for some people who are forbidding their children. But we get to Q. And also I'm making some sort of progress. And so we sort of enforce progress by saying that ground needs to be well bounded, which means you cannot go on forever outside of Q. Yeah, at some point you need to Q. And that's, that's pretty much it. So if you have a, a world exists in quantifier automation in your console, or you add it, something else it would be very nasty. So that you can do uh, so there is a branching local logic. Don't ask me about it. So, and there are also ways how we can actually decompose the uh, sort of complex uh, temporal logic protocol. So probably many of you have heard of this like that LTL is nasty, it's not compositional, it's ideal, it's great because it is compositional. Actually, this is a one way to put your thing on one compositionality in the case of CTL. So if you have a, a formula that is nested, it doesn't really mean uh, matter what all this matter speaks to. If you just have a formula that is syntactical, it's a term that can be a sub term. But perhaps in CTL, potentially, you can uh, capture sort of the meaning region of the sub formula and pretend that this is a starting sense for, for a different training system that deals with the sub formula on this E. Great, uh, great tools to develop by 
find the invariant and uh, so here's the, the identification of the, the size that you need to say. So if you take uh, uh, for a given k, it's a case on the outside, on the k. So if you uh, set a uh, look at the set of states captured by the variant p, then it say, should be found in the and you can go for some of the relations as well. That's for the So uh, this is our constraint. So, So if you wonder sort of how it relates to our assertion checking, actually count is very powerful. When you go to assertion uh, safety is the same the number of states, and the ground rotation is just zero. So it's a power. So um, how we resolve the numbers of the theory is also is So uh, what we're trying to do is that we're trying to kill the recursion, the recursive dependence inside the process by the whole thing. So it will be a longer while solve the bounded problems of the recursion without the angle into a try to explain the So here's the essentials of the raw method. This is not particular to very now. The majority of those things are on the secret groups. So you have the bounded problem, we solve it, we try to keep plugging the solution in the recursive case of the solution. So this is our uh, sort of one step unfolding. So say the solution can be composed of H1 and H1. So they all have the constraints which are now recursion free for H1 and H2. So you can solve them, we will plug it back into our recursive equation with the process of the that, that's the choice. So and what we are doing here is now actually so the tricky part is how to tell the recursion free case in the presence of the uh, Okay, so, so there is this amazing thing called interpolation in trick interpolation. And uh, in dramatic and writing now of type, but uh, so, uh, what happens is that you can set up a similar uh, sort of process in the world of uh, automated reasoning. So where instead of Picking up an upper problem from the unknown research that's supposed to be spin to be long and high, you can use the upper problem imposed by this cardinality constraint. And the sort of how it all works is in the case of arithmetic, it's using this amazing theory of, uh, of uh, generator functions. For those of you who heard about generator functions, this is amazing. And uh, for those who haven't, so I think it will be very, very cool. So for me it was like a big revelation. And so this is actually, there's a, uh, there's a two slide trick in that now. So what you can do, if you have your polytope, what you can do, you can build this generating function that essentially enumerates all the points in the polytope and generates the monomial for it. For example, there's, you can take some arbitrary variables for the dimensions, and then you use the coordinates of the points and the powers. Yeah, so like 0, 2 is this point, and then you go 1, 1, and so all, the, all these things. This is actually an utility description of the polytope. It's very algebraic, and it's actually it's very inefficient because you really have to go point by point. And it's a gigantic polynomial. But the cool thing about this one is that if you evaluate this polynomial in the input 1, 1, it gives you actually the number of points because each of the monomials will give you one. And there are as many monomials as there were points so by construction. So now we're getting a handle from sort of the world of you know, all these uh, shapes and volumes, the world of algebra is single conflict persists. So it's, it's inefficient. So, but luckily, there are these two guys, uh, many actually guys working, this is called convexity theory. Actually, they can make things simple. And the idea is actually, when you do the uh, counting, like volume of this room, actually, we really don't care about what's inside. The only thing we care about is the dimensions. Yeah? So, how long is this wall? How long is the ceiling? And based on, on the dimensions, you can calculate the volume. Same idea actually applies here. So you only need to look at the dimensions and now it's actually the vertex scopes. And everything that's inside doesn't really matter. So you can express everything from the vertex scopes. And so that's what they indicate. They say vertex code is given by the coordinates of the vertex plus the uh, plus the vectors. And the other, the old guys. 
And so what you can do here, actually, another cool thing is you can do it in composition, one vertex corner at a time. And this are going to be your anomalies. So, so this is how it goes. So you get the coordinates, you move back, and you get the, uh, sort of the vectors coming out of it. The yellow guys, you do it once for the vertex code, and you have the goal. Yeah? So there are some singularities, so you need to sort of let the polynomials take care of the singularity because see if you relate on one, you actually divide by zero. But you can think of the polynomial as just a data structure. Yeah? So you deal with it properly. <laughs> the cool thing is that it's, it's small and sort of gives you what you need. And then what you can do, you can say, if I need to solve for a, uh, for a room, find a room with a given volume. I make the dimensions symbolic. Yeah. I generate constraints for the symbolic dimensions in our example of letters. So you get the polynomial, you, you, this, you plug in this characteristic polynomial for the volume into your constraint system. And now it's business as usual. Uh, so this is the sort of the pipeline. So the first step. To generate this one closes but now with cardinality constraints. Then you uh, say, okay, what really matters if you do this sort of, uh, unfold, uh, sort of generate and check and sort of keep unfolding paradigms for dealing with recursion is the recursion free sort of cardinality interpolation case. You use the characteristic polynomials for generating functions. Partial and 
the solution to your problem. There's a gradient here, which is essentially splitting the cluster of the And so there's another thing actually I didn't talk about, but the programming verification is amazing, but network verification is double more exciting. So watch that space. And so essentially the idea is that uh, so the networks around us are essentially programmed. Thank you so much.